Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Greg Sanders, and I am the music director here at All Souls. And during our online COVID services, I'm also functioning as our technical director. Um, we're so excited to have you today. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are online with Reverend Miller. He is back with us today. We're so glad to have you again, Reverend Miller. Um, and our worship associate is the lovely Crystal Francis, always one of my favorites. Um, so we're so happy to uh, bring this service to you. Just a couple of pieces of advice as you enjoy the service today. We invite you to stay muted. We also invite you to engage with us through the chat function. You'll see things happening in there, um, live links, um, ways to fully engage with the message that you're hearing today. Um, and then following the service, we always have a virtual coffee hour and we invite you to stay for that too so that you can speak with your fellow congregants and visitors, get to know each other a little better and visit and get ready for Super Bowl Sunday. Thank you again for joining us today. I'm here if you have any questions. In the meantime, enjoy the service. We'll get started with a welcome from our worship associate, Crystal. Good morning. I'm Crystal Francis and I'm serving as the worship associate for this morning's service. We're online today, and next Sunday, we will be both online and in person. Reverend Joel will continue to communicate with the congregation as we resume in-person services. Yay! We currently have off coffee hour on Zoom after every service. You can find the link for coffee hour via Zoom on the homepage of our website at allsoulsindy.org. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, Sarah Cannon will tell you in a moment how you can do that in our connection card. If you're a visitor this morning, we're really glad that you're here with us. In a few moments, we will open our service with the beautiful ritual of the covenant and chalice lighting. We say our covenant as a way to remember and live out the community of love and justice that we aim to be. Welcome to all. We're glad to have you and your whole self with us today. Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad to be back with you. Some years ago now, I was, uh, was close to my birthday and a member of the church who knew that I have celiac disease, which means I cannot eat anything made of wheat or, or gluten, made me this most wonderful chocolate tort. No wheat, no gluten in it at all. Lots of chocolate. I've begun to understand why, why, why chocolate is such a great Valentine's Day event. She brought that tort in and, and, and I had to have a piece. It was really just delicious. I think maybe one of the most sublime things I'd ever eaten. So she had made me this entire large tort. And I had it in my office at the church. And it, as soon as uh, the member who'd made me the tort left, left, I had another member come in and, and he and I had been talking for some time about a really sticky problem he'd been having. And he'd, he'd really been almost despairing about what to do with this problem he was having. We had talked many times about it. And he, was, he was wrestling carefully with it. It mattered a great deal to him. And he, but he just felt stuck. I cut him a slice of the tort, having asked him, would you like some? And he'd said, oh, yeah, I suppose. Put it on, you know, it was one of those mismatched church plates. <laughs> the silverware didn't quite match. It was cool. It was church, right? So I gave him the tort, and he was he was talking to me about, you know, the, the latest the latest frustration about how to solve this issue. And he took a piece of the tort absentmindedly and put it into his mouth and stopped. And then he smiled. And then he just closed his eyes and enjoyed it. And he said, that was absolutely amazing. And then he ate some more. He just stopped talking to me. He just kept eating more of the tort. In fact, he just about finished it. And then he started laughing, he said, you know, you know, I think I know what I'm going to do about this problem. It, it, somehow, just the joy of the torts, the transformation of the taste, just completely transformed the moment for him and his problem. Always remembered that about chocolate, but 
I don't think it's just about chocolate. I actually think it's also about church. What we do for one another. Yes, community, but sometimes those delightful challenges that help us see beyond just where we are. Good morning. Welcome to All Souls and to our Sunday morning worship. At this time, I would like to light our chalice. I made sure that I found one that is both red and first principle for today. We will say together the covenant that is on the wall of our sanctuary and visible on the slide before you. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and love and to help one another. One another. This is our covenant. <clears throat> Eros and spirituality seems like a topic designed to lure an audience, but maybe not so much to encourage a personal reflection. Gosh, I, sorry. Wanted to be sure I could see myself. Um, but you know, it's not so much a topic to encourage personal reflection in front of you. Fortunately, as I researched the topic, I found a connection that resonated with me. Eros refers to love and desire as well as passion. Freud called it a life force with emphasis on the will to live and to create life. I know this feeling. I've seen it in others and I've experienced the strong will to live and to create. It is a powerful thing. I'm not talking about sex, although that could be encompassed in this feeling. For me, it is an opening of the heart and mind. As a child visiting my grandparents' farm, I experienced this sense when I was standing with my siblings and cousins at the top of a rise in a pasture full of knee-high grass nearly ready, ready to be cut for hay. The sun was close to sunset. I joyfully ran down the hill, losing control and rolling heads, head over heels down the slope, yelling and laughing all the way to the level ground. We followed this by spinning around and around until collapsing on the ground from dizziness. It was a glorious time of living in the moment. Another time, when I was recovering from a massive chest surgery involving a cancerous tumor in my rib cage, it was really painful. Some days were just a blur as my body healed. In a moment of inspiration, I turned on my music and listened to music in quite a while. It could have been many different pieces, maybe by Ravel, Silson Croft, Carol King, I don't know, probably all and more. What I do know is that the music almost immediately was both healing and life affirming. It awakened the life within me, coaxing my soul to rise up. My boyfriend at the time had proposed months before, but I told him that I saw need for a, any need for us to be married. But after the surgery, I realized I wanted a closer connection to him to celebrate life. We were in love. Slow dancing to Van Morrison's moon dance affirmed the desire to make a life together. Then just a few months after our marriage, I became pregnant, which is a story for another time, but it was a really big deal. It was a surprise pregnancy that my doctors thought might spur a reoccurrence of cancer. And my mother was terrifically angry that I might be at risk. She wasn't happy about the pregnancy. Me. I felt a peace that it was just wonderful. My nine pound, 13 ounce boy's eyes looked just like mine when our eyes first met. It is hard to imagine a more powerful life affirmation than I when I look at him. And it still is. Are you looking for life affirmation? It is all around us. 
go and see the Loom exhibit at Newfields. Listen to some good music. Write a poem. Sing a child to sleep. Sit on the porch swing on a warm summer night. It is all there and other places ready to rise up inside you. Thanks. Good morning again, good people. Today, as you know, Reverend Joel is talking about how we think about love and when we feel it. The universalist part of our theological heritage calls us to love others and to look for the good in them. And this week, Soul Matters reminds us to widen the circle of how we value ourselves. So I'm going to tell you a story about a kid who was working on those things. This is Daisy. Daisy's mom walked her to school every day and every day the same thing happened. It had been bugging her for a while. Fortunately, Daisy had finally talked to her mom about it the night before. Remember what we agreed, said her mom, your body, your rules. Oh, there you are, cried their neighbor, Mrs. Weebelow. Come here and give me a hug. Daisy did not want to give Mrs. Weebelow a hug. She also did not like it when Mrs. Weebelow squeezed her cheeks and said, aren't you just a little cinnamon roll? Daisy knew how she looked on the inside. And she was not a little cinnamon roll. She was a warrior princess on a dragon. Sometimes she pictured the dragon breathing fire at Mrs. Weebelow. No, thank you, said Daisy. I would not like a hug today. She and her mom kept walking. When they got to school, she did give her mom a hug because she wanted to. Bye, Daisy. Love you, said her mom. Love you too, said Daisy. Ew, said a kid on the other side of the playground. You love your mom? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty normal, said Daisy. She felt kind of sorry for the kid's mom, though. In class, Daisy finished her math worksheet early, so she started to wool gather. This does not mean she went to a farm school with real sheep. It means that her mind wandered the way a farmer has to wander when they are gathering tufts of wool that got stuck on bushes or fences as their sheep walked by. Daisy was wool gathering about love. Hmm. At church, she had learned about universalism. Universalists believed in love. They believed that a higher power would love every person, would be able to see things that made them special, even when they were being annoying or downright rotten. They also believed in following that example themselves. It was hard to do sometimes, like when Mrs. Weebelow called her a cinnamon roll. She knew Mrs. Weebelow truly cared about her, even if she was bad at noticing when Daisy was not here for hugs or face squishes. But the situation was frustrating. Daisy could be universalist when she thought about her teacher, Mr. Paisley. He listened to every student and always looked interested. He was very thoughtful about giving breaks instead of being annoyed when her class was getting wiggly. And he drove an electric car, which made her think he cared about the earth. She decided to keep an eye out for more people she could love in a universalist kind of way. Now, it was Friday and Daisy's friend Rosa was sleeping over. So after school, as a special treat, Daisy's mom took them to Culver's to get dinner. Daisy found that she could be universalist even when the order taker was crabby. After all, there was always a huge line at Culver's, so she figured the workers got really tired after a while. I bet they're not crabby on their days off, said Daisy. And her mom laughed. I bet you're right, she said. They brought their dinner home and chowed down at the table. Then Daisy and Rosa went to the other room to make some Valentines and watch a movie. Ugh, said Rosa, flopping down on Daisy's sofa. I shouldn't have eaten those French fries. My belly is too big. Daisy thought Rosa was basically perfect. She was funny and nice and wore purple better than anyone and never told anybody Daisy's secrets. I don't think your belly is too big, said Daisy. It's Rosa's size. Be nice to my friend Rosa. Then you have to be nice to my friend Daisy, said Rosa, and stop saying you look ugly in glasses. 
Daisy thought about this while they did art. She totally did say that every time she wore her glasses. Her mom always looked sad when she said it, and then Daisy felt bad because she knew her mom had paid extra to get the glasses Daisy liked best. Daisy didn't like wearing glasses, but it was mostly because a kid in her class had called her four eyes, which was a really silly name because obviously Daisy didn't have four eyes, but it still made her feel like everyone was staring at her with brownie faces. So when she looked in the mirror, she convinced herself that she didn't look nice at all. That's when it hit Daisy. Here she was thinking about universalist love and then telling herself she looked ugly in glasses. How is she supposed to be universalist toward other people when she couldn't even do that for herself? I think we should make Valentine's for us first, she told Rosa. That will remind us to be nice to ourselves. That sounds fun, said Rosa. Daisy was surprised to realize she had to think about what she wanted to say on her Valentine. There was more than one choice. She thought about how she'd been brave by standing up for herself when she didn't want hugs and face squooshes. She thought about how she'd used her intelligence to do a good job on her math worksheet. She thought about how she was using her heart by working on caring about people in a more universalist way. Finally, she wrote down, you try. She liked being a person who tried and love seemed like an especially good thing to try hard at. Rosa made a Valentine for herself to go with daisies and you can make one too. I put them in your families this week for you to print. And there's a stack of these Valentines in the hall under the bulletin board with the hearts on it. So when you're here in person, you can do one for soul work during the service or grab some to take home. Leave them around where you'll see them. So you remember to widen the circle of how you value yourself this Valentine's week. Thank you. Today we're talking and thinking and listening to ideas about erotic wisdom. What is the erotic? It comes from the ancient Greek word eros. Not just about sex, although in American culture especially, it often gets confused with just sex. It's a lot more than that. One of the things about eros and its creative power is that we have to be safe and we have to be vulnerable and we have to be caring of ourselves and others to truly experience it. And so this practice that we share of sharing joys and sorrows, whether we're doing it in silence or doing it uh, sharing with actual words some of our experiences, it's a part of that practice of knowing ourselves spiritually and deeply, understanding all that we are. Because in coming to all souls, at least, not every Unitarian Universalist congregation, we hope that everyone who comes among us can, can come with all they are, can be all that they are in love. And so we share joys and sorrows at this time. One uh, wonderful joy is that Virginia DeForno's birthday is February 28th. And uh, I believe there are some celebrations being planned because I believe she's going to be 100 years old. It'd be great to uh, send her some cards and uh, celebrate that uh, um, amazing milestone in life. I want to share my own joy at being able to be back with you after uh, having suffered a concussion three, three weeks ago. Um, I've been grateful for time to rest and grateful to be back because let me tell you, recovering from a, a concussion is boring. And uh, a joy for the congregation um, through your generosity with, especially with the last capital campaign, uh, we're able to make repairs to the building. Um, and by the way, there's a meeting on March 13th, an emergency meeting, meeting of the congregation after the service so that you can approve the expenditures. There are other joys here among us this morning, as well as sorrows. 
We don't know all of them. Not all of them may, we may want to share. But they are among us and they do matter. And we are here and do want to know about them if you want to share. I offer this meditation as we think about what it means to be vulnerable enough to truly share from the depths of our hearts and the depths of our love. I stretch forth my hand, knowing not what I shall touch, a tender spot, an open wound, warmth, pulsing life, fragile blossoms, a rock, ice. I am tentative, trembling, wishing to avoid hurt, wanting to link my life with life. Lonely, I desire companions. Naked, I long for defenders. Lost, I want to find, to be found. Will I touch strangers or enemies or nothing? My hand is withdrawn, but it still touches my vulnerable skin, my furrowed brow, my empty pocket, my full heart. Do others reach, tremble, withdraw? Do they desire, long, seek? Are they lonely, fearful, lost? Will they grasp this tentative, trembling hand? I stretch forth my hand, knowing not what I shall touch, but hoping.
Audre Lorde was an African-American lesbian feminist, poet, scholar, a mother of two children, an activist, a professor, and a cancer survivor. She wrote about the erotic. Her poetry and her prose are for me amazing invitations to know the erotic as a great deal more than just sex. She wrote of the erotic as something that embodies all of our desires, is the root of all of our love. Let me share you with you her words. It's from her article, Uses of the Erotic. We have been raised to fear the yes within ourselves, to fear our deepest cravings. We have come to distrust that power which rises from the deepest and non-rational knowledge we have. And there are many kinds of power, used and unused, acknowledged or otherwise. The erotic is a resource within each of us that lies in a deeply spiritual plane, firmly rooted in the power of our unexpressed or unrecognized feeling. The word erotic comes from the Greek word eros, the personification of love in all of its aspects. Eros, born of chaos and personifying creative power and harmony. When I speak of the erotic, then, I speak of it as an assertion of the life force of creative energy and power. So our uh, uh, educator, our professional educator, Sarah Cannon, uh, announced the uh, a session for, I think, fourth and fifth graders of OWL. And I think next Sunday, also parents of, of uh, our, our children and youth uh, have the opportunity to attend the second session of parents as sexuality educators. Both of these are part of the larger OWL program sexuality education for people of all ages in our Unitarian Universalist congregations. We have been teaching sex ed in our congregations for 51 years. I like that the Harry Potter novels uh, talk about owl, although nothing like the owl that we have in Unitarian Universalist churches. And to be fair, we used the name owl long before JK Rowling wrote her novels. In our congregations, OWL stands for our whole lives, our whole lives, all of our lives. So when we talk about having a sexuality education program, we actually mean more than just sex. We mean our whole lives, truly the sense of eros, of the erotic. And what we hope in our education program is that we can help one another discover erotic wisdom and understand, as Audre Lorde said, sex is only a part, really a small part, of the whole human experience, especially of the erotic. Eros itself is this abulent, this eager, this disruptive energy that when we're in touch with it, when, and when we are in harmony with our bodies and our spirits and the life around us, we connect and it's powerful. We find ourselves changed, eating an amazing chocolate tort. And suddenly life seems lighter, brighter. For many people, the energy of the erotic is the presence of God. If you're not a theist, erotic energy empowers reproduction and art. It pushes us to be diverse and creative. I believe personally that a healthy religion helps us all see how beautiful we are, like that first principle that comes from our universalist heritage that Sarah Cannon mentioned. They are so beautiful. Our lives have worth in them. 
I called my old friend Dan the other day. He's single after a long relationship. and He's having his first Valentine's Day as a single person. So I asked him, so are you going to have any fun on Valentine's Day? He laughed and he said, I think it's going to be strange. It's probably a better word for it. No date for, for Dan on Valentine's Day. I think the strangest thing for him is that he feels simultaneously relieved and disappointed. Feels both of, things, both of those things at the same time. The erotic can often be confusing, unexpected. If you look the word up in the dictionary, just the word erotic, it just means sex. But if you look at the base word of the word erotic, the erotic coming from that word eros, eros has a much wider, more interesting meaning. Eros was, for example, the ancient Greek god of erotic love. Eros was seen as a fundamental creative impulse by the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. And again, as Crystal Francis mentioned, by Freud, a uh, scholar who lived in the early 20th century. I've seen a definition that's kind of technical and philosophical, but I thought helpful. Eros is the sum of life-preserving instincts that are manifested as impulses to gratify basic needs, as sublimated impulses, and impulses to protect and preserve our bodies and our minds. Fancy ways of saying, when we express the erotic in our lives, it should feel good. Sometimes it's important to focus the erotic in constructive and healthy ways. And the erotics often functions as a way to remind us, take care of ourselves. Christian theologians often write about how ancient Greek philosophers talked about all different kinds of love. There are more kinds of love than just eros or the erotic. Ancient Greek philosophers and Christian philosophers often talk about four kinds of, of love, eros, but also philios, agape, and storge. Now, philios is the love of friendship. You might find that here at All Souls, making friends, perhaps in a small group. Storge is the love of family, of parents and children, of partners, of extended family. And agape, agape is the love of charity and of God. Or if you're not a theist, a love of all that is and what is transcendent. Some theologians, even today, will say that agape is the best kind of love and eros is the worst kind of love. And I know that they usually say eros is the worst kind of love because it includes sex. A lot of theologians are very uncomfortable with sex. Perhaps there's a reason for this. In the southwestern United States, many of the Indian peoples there tell mythic stories about coyote. And this isn't just any old coyote, it's the mythic coyote, almost like a god figure, perhaps even a god figure. Coyote is a trickster god, a mythic being. He's always scheming, always looking for things that feel good, and never really understanding the consequences of his actions. Maybe not caring, or maybe forgetting, or maybe both. Now, coyote is neither bad nor good in these mythic stories of these Indian peoples that live in Arizona or New Mexico or Colorado. He just is. But sometimes what he does is good. Sometimes what he does is bad. And one of the things about Coyote is that he's lusty. 
he, he likes sex, not just the erotic. He really likes sex, especially. It's a kind of force of life, though, even so. Not necessarily bad or good, it just is. But the thing about Coyote is that he so often cuts it off from love. His lust is not linked to art, to love, to health, to his friendships, to accountability. Well, I'm talking about it in fancy ways. Coyote doesn't, Coyote does stuff and he doesn't pay attention to how it, other people may be hurt. He is the power of the erotic without the guide of erotic wisdom. And so here's a story that's an example. Coyote one day is at the edge of a river. He's drinking water and he falls into the river, shakes himself as he's starting to uh, catch his breath and find out how to get back to the riverbank. And he notices downstream there are two women and they are bathing themselves, washing up. Coyote sees them. They don't have all of their clothes on and Coyote growls in pleasure being Coyote. But he knows he can't just float downstream and stare at them. That would be rude. And anyway, they would leave. They would see it was Coyote was coming and they'd get that. They'd get out, get out of the area. So Coyote thinks, oh, I know what I can do. And he changes himself into a beautiful piece of driftwood. He's floating downstream, staring, which Coyote can do, even though he's a piece of driftwood. One of the women picks up the pretty stick and the other woman looks at it and the other woman realizes, this, this might be dangerous. We should throw it back. Don't touch it. Too late. Two women soon find that they are pregnant. They're going to have babies. This primordial creative power of the universe can sometimes be like this trickster god coyote. A force that's neither good nor bad, but also not always very safe. It's powerful. It comes from chaos, as the ancient Greeks said in their stories. An elemental force that may even precede spirituality and religion itself. So we humans, especially we Unitarian Universalists, who want to be accountable for how we use our creative powers, for how we live love in a world that needs all the love it can get. We think about what does it mean to be people, beings of erotic lives and erotic wisdom. So we teach L in our congregations. And perhaps for many of us, the, the most immediate understanding, the most intense experiences we've had of the erotic might have happened when we were teenagers. And so we have owl classes just for teenagers. And I've had teenage Unitarian Universalists ask me when I have taught owl classes, so how do we know when we can start having sex with other people? I'll often start, talk, start talking about erotic wisdom. I'll start talking about uh, with some teenagers, for example, I used to talk about with teenagers, the. Uh, offer the advice that, well, you know, if you can have conversations with a, the person you would like to have sex with, full conversations about what you'd like to do, not to, not to do, um, and um, when and where, and if you can have conversations with your parents about it and negotiate your way through those conversations, I think you might be ready. I was mentioning this, um, this sense I have of what erotic wisdom is, and uh, um, another Unitarian Universalist mentioned to me the other day that, you know, if I had decided that erotic wisdom was being able to talk with my parents about it, um, my very Catholic mother would have decided I would never have sex ever in my life. So I have to reframe my understanding of what erotic wisdom is a little bit. You know, the truth is erotic wisdom takes a lifetime to acquire. 
one sexuality educator told me that the same questions that a teenager needs to ask are the same questions that a 40 year old needs to ask that a 60 year old needs to ask that even 80 year olds need to ask what are those what are those questions what is this wisdom Audre Lorde called the erotic are creative energy empowered. First, we have to know that it's not just about sex. It's the way in which desire, creativity, justice, community, friendship, parenthood, peace, love can be something that's experienced all at once. But, you know, that's going to take, I'm not even there yet. All of those things in that long list. I've had sexuality ed educators recommend some basic things that any, any of us considering an erotic relationship with others should consider. One, let's keep each other safe. Two, we have to be honest. Three, we have to respect one another, not use one another for like Coyote would, for example. We have to care about the well-being of other people. And four, created in a way that, you know, that what we do should be enjoyable for all and cause harm to none. Perhaps to put it in a way that Crystal Francis put it, whether it's sex or not, actually, if you're going to roll down a hill and just roll and, and let loose and, and have a great time doing that, which is something I still like to do, actually. Just make sure you have a safe place to land at the bottom of the hill. Um, don't do what I did once in my life and um, have a very narrow riverbank at the end and end up going for a swim. I knew a 80-year-old uh, humanist man once, a fellow named Art. Art was kind of fierce. He'd experienced a lot of difficult things in life and a lot of wonderful things in life. His beloved wife had died about 10 years before and he missed her terribly. He lived on his own and had continued to work. And then when he couldn't work or live in his home anymore, he went into a uh, uh, retirement community. He and I were talking about life in the retirement community. First thing he said was, I should have moved there a lot sooner. I'm making all kinds of friends. And then he said to me, and Joel, you should, I want you to tell other people this. You know that term puppy love? It has to apply to 80 year olds like me, or else it's a gratuitous insult against teenagers. And he told me that because he said, because I'm feeling it. I'm having the same passions at 80 that I felt when I was 17. You tell people that. Oh, the other thing he mentioned to me was, age does not automatically confer wisdom. As you can imagine, he was still learning things, even at 80. I think another part of erotic wisdom is that no one should presume that a religion can overcome the erotic powers of the universe. It's actually, I think, a coyote kind of error, thinking that we're always in charge. There will never be a book of perfect rules that controls the creative forces of the universe. And thinking that there is, we may excuse ourselves from being accountable for our actions. Forget that love is something that has to be lived and has to be done in relationship with each other. And that's what our living tradition asks of us as Unitarian Universalists. All of our forms of love, philios, storge, agape, eros, we have to think and consider the consequences of our actions as best as we can, seek forgiveness when we cause harm, get more erotic wisdom, and be quick not to take offense. Perhaps a simple way of 
talking about it when it comes to sex? Can you understand and accept the consequences of your actions? All of us consider that and think, yeah, I think I can, even teenagers and even 80 year olds. Well, it's not always as easy as it looks, but you might know you're there that if, you, if you're able to speak clearly with a partner about using safe sex practices, about being able to clearly explain to what each other what feels good and what feels bad, to be aware of not hurting others, to be accountable. My uh, 80 year old friend Art recommended those years ago another way to understand erotic wisdom. He said, you know, my recommendation is to live your life so you can look back at a lot of good memories. I've always thought that was great advice to a pretty young minister at the time. In fact, that's what I hope for all of us, regardless of the kind of love we're living, regardless of whether we're interested in sex or not interested in sex, both perfectly reasonable feelings to have. Love should create a wonderful memory that you enjoy for the rest of your lives. This is the wisdom that we need as erotic beings. The wisdom by which we make choices that are blessings. Those that create memories that we cherish. May Valentine's Day, whatever it means for you, be one that ultimately brings blessings, that ultimately leads, leads to the blessings of all kinds of love. And may we, as a congregation, be a place that helps us find that wisdom. Let our lives be prayers of love, prayers that water dry souls, that mend broken hearts, that refuse to be terrorized, and shelter us through all storms. Go in peace, be in peace. Look forward to seeing you again next Sunday.